This program is made possible by the support of Delta Dental, Quick Trip, Marshfield Clinic Health System, Wisconsin Counties Association, Wisconsin Hospital Association. Watch Wisconsin Eye on Spectrum Channels 995 and 363 and at wisi.org. Wisconsin, Governor Tony Evers here. And I'm Lieutenant Anytime you're around others who you don't share a home or a living unit with. Next, always wear. This briefing is being aired live on YouTube. A reminder to maintain audio quality to please stay on mute until it's time to ask your question. If you're able to do so, please use star six to mute and unmute. Joining us for today's media briefing are Governor Tony Evers, DHS Secretary Designee Andrea Palm, and also available to answer questions are Deb Standridge, the CEO of the Wisconsin State Fair Park Alternate Care Facility, Dr. Ryan Westergaard, the Chief Medical Officer for the DHS Bureau of Communicable Diseases, and Ryan Nilsestoon, the Chief Legal Counsel in the Office of the Governor. We'll begin the briefing with remarks from Governor Tony Evers. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us again today. In April, we announced the construction of the Wisconsin State Fair Park Alternate Care Facility as a critical extension of the health care systems in the Southeast region and, frankly, all across the state. Yesterday, I warned that our healthcare systems were teetering and that they are on the brink. And unfortunately, today we announced that we have received a request to open our alternative care facility in Milwaukee due to increased COVID-19 hospitalizations and the strain this surge is causing on our healthcare systems. We obviously hoped this day wouldn't come, but unfortunately, Wisconsin is in a much different and more dire place today, and our healthcare systems are being overwhelmed. On September 7th, there were 289 patients hospitalized with COVID-19 in Wisconsin. In just one month, that number has nearly tripled with 853 hospitalizations as of yesterday with a significant surge in the Fox Valley, Northeast, Northwest, North Central, and Western regions of our state. This alternative care facility at State Fair Park will take some of the pressure off the system by providing 530 additional patient spaces while expanding the continuum of care for folks who have COVID-19. 
To be clear, this isn't a hospital and the State Fair Park facility will not accept walk-in patients. Patients will be admitted to this facility in coordination with our health care providers. And the facility's patients will largely be individuals who are transitioning out of the hospitals and require less medical care. I want to recognize the hard work and courage of our frontline health care workers and providers. Those caring for our most vulnerable Wisconsinites as they receive treatment for COVID-19 and all those on the front lines of this pandemic. These folks are working around the clock to keep us all safe and to care for our loved ones and are risking their own health and safety to do so. Now, they can't stay home. That's why it's critical, perhaps now more than ever, that Wisconsinites step up and stay home as much as you are able. Your actions can not only help stop the spread of the virus, therefore reducing the number of hospitalizations and saving lives, but it also protects our frontline healthcare workers because we need these folks to stay healthy so that they can continue to do their important work and serve our communities. Early on in the pandemic, we often use the phrase flattening the curve to describe, describe our public health goals. And we were successful in doing so because of our safer at home efforts and the sacrifices Wisconsinites made to keep their family and friends and neighbors safe. That is what we are asking you to help us to do once again. But this time we are on a much more different, much more dire place. As I said yesterday, wearing a mask is simply not enough to flatten the curve. I'm once again calling on Wisconsinites to hunker down and stay home as much as possible and limit travel only to the essential needs. We also need businesses, employers, and leaders to take precautions for their employees, customers, and, the, and their larger community. I'm calling on you all to make adjustments to limit the contact your employees have with customers and one another as much as you are able. As I've said before, it's going to take each and every one of us. It's all hands on deck, folks, because we may, we may not have this, some critical statewide tools to stop this spread, but we can have a statewide united effort. And frankly, that's that's what it's going to take to not only get our state and economy back on tr track, but to save lives. Now, I know this is easier said than done. Workers still have to work, students still have to learn, and Wisconsinites still have to put food on the table and roofs over their heads. That's why I would also like to take a moment today to update you on another announcement we made this week, providing an additional $47 million in COVID-19 support for child care and energy and rental assistance for Wisconsinites. This investment includes $10 million for the COVID-19 out of school grant program aimed at assisting organizations that provide care to school aged kids during the pandemic. $10 million for the Wisconsin rental assistance program in addition to the $25 million previously allocated that has helped nearly 10,000 households so far. And another $10 million will go to the Food Security Initiative to combat hunger, as well as another $16 million that will be invested in programming to help Wisconsinites afford their energy and heat as winter months set in. And finally, an additional $1 million investment will be made to help folks, folks get connected to health insurance for those who may have lost coverage in the last year because we need to make sure folks have the support they need to handle the financial crisis challenges the pandemic has brought us, from housing and food security to making sure they have access to quality, affordable health care as we continue to fight COVID-19. Finally, I want to close the day by thanking our first response responders, health care professionals, and other essential workers on the front lines. I know this isn't easy, I know it's stressful, and you all are working long, emotionally exhausting hours. But even in this time of physical distancing, I want you to know that we are here for you and we support you. Now I'd like to turn it over to Secretary-Designee Andrea Palm for her update. 
Andrea. Thanks, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us again today. Uh, I'm going to start with the numbers today because I, I need to make sure that we all see how dire our situation is here in Wisconsin. There are now 138,698 confirmed cases of COVID-19, which is an increase of 2,319 positive cases over yesterday. Our total deaths have now reached 1,415. That is an increase of 16 over yesterday. 55 of Wisconsin's 72 counties meet the threshold of very high disease activity level. That's an increase of 10 counties since last week. The rest of the counties in the state of Wisconsin are at a high disease activity level. Wisconsin as a whole is also at a very high disease activity level. Across the state, the number of COVID-19 hospitalizations has increased 26% this week compared to last week. In the South Central region, that increase is much higher at 54%. The number of COVID-19 patients in the ICU is also much higher than before. Across Wisconsin, we have seen an increase of almost 27% since last week. In three of our regions, that increase is actually greater than 60%. The Fox Valley, Northeast, and Southeast regions are operating at or over 90% of their ICU capacity. Today, we set a record for both the number of hospitalized COVID-19 patients and the number of COVID patients in the ICU. But the strain on our healthcare system is not only measured in hospital beds. We must also think about the people working in these hospitals. Their heroic work is saving lives but it is also growing more and more difficult in the face of colleagues out sick or in quarantine because of intense community spread. Every region in Wisconsin has hospitals reporting current and imminent staffing shortages, and at least one region is reporting these shortages in a majority of their hospitals. Our public health system is also stretched beyond capacity. With our current surge, many of our local and tribal health departments are not able to keep up with contact tracing. We are supplementing their efforts at the state level, and we have just posted another hiring announcement for contact tracers, but it will take time before these new hires are in place and able to assist. So what does this all mean? It means our state is in a dangerous place. We are overwhelming our healthcare system. That is why we are announcing today as the governor mentioned, that the alternate care facility in West Allis will open next Wednesday. We stood this facility up in the spring and have not needed to use it until now, so the next week will be spent readying it to begin receiving patients. The West Allis alternate care facility will, will serve as an overflow facility for hospitals across the state, accepting patients who have tested positive for COVID-19, have been hospitalized for 48 hours, and are ambulatory. This will free up beds in our hospitals to better care for more severely ill COVID and non-COVID patients. The current surge in hospitalizations and the need for this alternate care facility is a direct result of the surge in cases we began to see in September. And our case counts today are even higher. Our seven day average of new daily cases is 2,346, up from 879 one month ago. To be clear, this is going to get worse before it gets better. Our current surge in cases will lead to even more hospitalizations, and we must prepare for that. We are only, uh, excuse me, we are one of only a few states in the country to need to open an alternate care facility. This is not a list we ever wanted to be on, but we are thankful, thankful to be prepared. However, we must each work as a state and as individuals to flatten the curve immediately. Please stay home. Wear a mask when you go out for the essentials. Stay six feet apart. Wash your hands frequently. Get your flu shot. And if you have symptoms or have been exposed to COVID-19, please get tested, quarantine, answer the call of the contact tracers, and assist them by providing full and truthful information. We're in crisis in Wisconsin. A crisis calls for drastic measures, and I'm calling on every single one of us to do all that we can to protect each other. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll now take your questions. A reminder to maintain audio quality to please stay on mute until it's time to ask your question. 
And we'll begin today with Denise Lockwood from Racine County I. Denise? Thanks for taking my call. My question is is really trying to understand the impact on the the elderly uh, population, and I'm I'm hearing some reports about uh, some of the people that were in long term care facilities being transferred to hospitals, but those long term care facilities uh, may not be accepting those patients back. Is that accurate, or how would you frame that? Uh, appreciate the question. So I think, um, uh, you know, a patient who is cur- who lives in a, a skilled nursing facility in a nursing home, uh, you know, they may need hospitalization for a variety of things. And in normal circumstances, right, they would be transferred to their local hospital, receive care, receive treatment that they need, and when they're ready, return to their uh, nursing home, to their skilled nursing facility. Uh, in, in the situation we are in now where we're seeing um, outbreaks in skilled nursing facilities um, in our nursing homes and right the, as a result of this really intense community spread, you have situations where when a patient is ready to return to their skilled nursing facility um, uh, and that nursing home has a suspected case, has a positive case, has an outbreak, uh, they, they may be temporarily restricting admissions as they track down um, that outbreak uh, so that they can um, quarantine patients, um, you know, if they need to move folks around so that they, they've got a wing or a floor or a space that is separating, um, you know, healthy, healthy uh, skilled nursing residents from those who uh, are positive or suspected uh, cases. Um, and so you, you need to give nursing homes the space to do that work so that they are protecting those very vulnerable folks who live in their care. And so um, uh, it, it, right, it's, uh, it has exacerbated the issues that we have around uh, bed space and bed capacity. Uh, and so we are working very hard in cooperation uh, with our, our skilled nursing facilities, with our nursing homes, and with our hospital systems uh, around, um, you know, to do some creative problem solving and some, some solu- um, uh, looking for solutions that will allow us to continue to move patients who no longer need hospital level of care, um, uh, but whose, whose skilled nursing facility may be temporarily not uh, able to take them because of um, a COVID issue in that facility. So uh, it's work we're doing, it's work we need to do um, uh, because we've got to protect those really vulnerable citizens while we um, do everything we can to make sure we have as much bed capacity in our hospitals as possible. Thank you, Denise. Now to Rob Sussman from WTAQ Radio in Green Bay. Rob? Thanks for taking my question. Um, The Wisconsin Restaurants Association, Kristen Helmer with that association, says about half of the new restaurants in the state could close as a result of the orders signed yesterday and going into force uh, tomorrow. My question for uh, Governor Evers is, uh, what do you say to these people who may be losing their jobs, losing their businesses as a direct result of this order? Thank you. Yeah, and and thank you. Uh, There's a couple things to remember. This order is two weeks long. Uh, it's, not a, it's not forever, it's temporary, and it's not closing anything. They still have uh, 25% uh, uh, capacity to work with. That said, of course I understand how important it is, and that's why we, uh, put, we, we, we uh, allocated $50 million yesterday to WEDC for small businesses. Uh, I'm very hopeful that those restaurants and bars that feel that are in, in this situation are applying for that money as we speak. And just to clarify one thing, though, the order is for four weeks long. Yep. Four weeks. It, it, the order is for two incubation periods, which is approximately 14 days each, which is uh, 28 days or 30 days. Thank you, Rob. Now to Katie Anderson from WBAY-TV in Green Bay. Katie. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, The governor mentioned that the people who will be or would be moved to this new site um, in Milwaukee, um, they are not going to be, they're going to require less medical care. Therefore, why would they just, why wouldn't hospitals just move them back home um, or something of that nature instead of moving them to a whole new different 
site of overflow and also what kind of care will they be getting at this site if it's not if it's less medical care thank you uh, so the the alternate care facility is uh, it is not um, a full fledged hospital. It is designed to treat COVID patients who need uh, who who are on their road to recovery and do need less uh, less medical care. Uh, of the five hundred and thirty um, uh, available beds at the alternate care facility, about two hundred ninety six. 295, uh, something right in that range, um, have inline oxygen, um, um, but it is designed for a lower, um, a lower level of care and, and to take the pressure off our hospital system so that they uh, can, can focus on and really um, uh, concentrate on, the, on their COVID and non-COVID patients who do need uh, a higher level of care. I don't know, um, Deb, if you want to say anything more specific, I, I'd certainly uh, welcome that. Thank you, uh, Secretary Powell. I can give an example of uh, the type of patient that would be cared for at the alternate care facility. And I think the easiest way to understand the alternate care facility is exactly what it says. It's an alternative to a hospital setting. So a patient would be transferred from a potentially a Fox Valley hospital down to the alternate care facility. They would be between the ages of 18 and uh, 70 years old. They have been in the hospital for 24 to 48 hours. This is a hospital to transfer to the alternate care facility. It is not a physician clinic. It is not a physician office. Patients there would be relatively healthy, be able to ambulate on their own or have the assistance of one person. And they would need more oxygen therapy. We have, as you mentioned, Secretary Palm, inline oxygen provided. They may need additional IV medications or other types of medications to ensure they are healthy enough to be discharged home. There is a multidisciplinary team of physicians, allied health, nurses, patient care assistants, respiratory therapists, social workers that are part of the multidisciplinary team that designs a care plan for the patients that are there and will discharge the patients back home or to a facility that they, um, they were transferred from. Thank you, Katie. Now to Mitchell Schmidt from the Wisconsin State Journal. Mitchell. Yeah, thank you very much for the call today. Um, I was just kind of curious with respect to the alternate care facility that has been discussed at the Alliance Center here in Dade County, is there any sort of a tipping point or threshold that would necessitate the activation of that site as well? Uh, just trying to kind of curious as far as if we're heading in the direction where that might be necessary as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, we we obviously are um, are in conversations uh, with our local partners here in the Dane County area um, uh, to assess uh, you know where we are, where we're headed, how um, uh, surge capacity is being shared around the state in light of the situation we're in uh, in the Fox Valley, and and like we did um, in making the decision related to the alternate care facility that uh, we're currently. Uh, standing up uh, uh, in the Milwaukee area, uh, we will make that decision in conjunction with uh, with the with the local folks. I think it is important to remember, however, that we did not take um, the 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 Dane County location as far into the process as uh, as the Milwaukee location, and uh, so. Um, uh, it is. It will require a, a consider, considerably more time to stand up. Should that be necessary? Uh, so just to set expectations around, um, it is. It is not a flip switch ready um, like uh, like the one in in Milwaukee is. Thank you, Mitchell. Now to Eric Gunn from Wisconsin Examiner. Eric. Thank you for taking the call. I'm wondering uh, if you can tell us more about the findings that healthcare workers are being infected in the community versus on the job. Is that predominantly the case? And how does that, how do you sort of verify that out, that that's the source of the uh, infection? Um, and more, what more you can say about that whole uh, piece of information? Thank you. Yeah, I, I would certainly welcome Dr. Westergaard's comments. I think um, uh, I think the the protocols and the processes in the hospitals are designed um, to protect those workers uh, from infection in those settings. I'm not saying that it is not possible, um, but what we are saying, what we do know, is that it is uh, it is um, exposure in communities um, when when they are outside of work 
Um, and, and it is, you know, once they, once they are exposed and, and need to be tested in quarantine, uh, it, it may it may be that that test comes back negative, but you can't risk that that person being in the hospital. And so, you, you, with community spread like we're seeing, we are uh, we are seeing many more exposures, um, potential contacts with a COVID positive case that is requiring those folks to stay out of the workforce uh, uh, while they are quarantining and, and awaiting uh, test results. I think that's right. With with a, with a few exceptions, it's very difficult to, to prove one way or the other. We do, there are some situations where we can use advanced methods to identify the strain of the virus using genetic, tech, genetic technology called sequencing. Um, but I think the more important uh, issue is that the, the precautions in hospitals, the, the use of PPE, the droplet precautions, the use of the respirators or the N95 masks when people are, when patients are using, are undergoing aerosol generating procedures. The evidence is very, very strong that those are effective and they dramatically reduce the risk of infection to healthcare workers. So there's good reason to believe that um, healthcare worker infections acquired at the job are, are very rare, possibly not zero, but very rare. And in the setting of widespread community transmission, the, the assumption is that the large majority of cases in healthcare workers are acquired in the community and not at work. Thank you, Eric. Now to Mark Stevens from CBS 58 in Milwaukee. Mark? Um, how much pressure are we anticipating this facility is going to take off um, hospitals immediately? I guess another phrase is how many patients should we expect, you know, next week? Yeah, so we are having um, daily conversations with, um, uh, with the hospitals about uh, uh, that first day and the, the potential uh, transfer of patients on the day. Obviously, um, uh, we won't know for sure until we get a little closer because census changes on a daily basis. Um, but but we will be uh, we'll be ready on day one to take as many as uh, fifty patients and we'll scale from there. Um, but but again, we we will continue to be in in close contact with those hospitals as we so that we have a full understanding of where we are and what they will need uh, on day one. Thank you, Mark. Now to John Stothlett from NBC 15 in Madison. John? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, there are hundreds of cases in the prison system. I know a few months ago, um, the Chicago Region Director for Homeland Security and regional, or the federal government was here I know you have a facility in the Milwaukee area. Um, pr uh, prisoners would not be taken to this field activation hospital, I'm assuming, and, and where would they be going and has that hospital been activated? Uh, prisoners are, are quarantined and isolated within the facilities that they, uh, uh, they're pr presently uh, assigned to. So the people in our care and our, our correctional uh, facilities once they're identified, of course, we do the contact training, uh, tracing, excuse me. But uh, at, at the end of the day, the isolation and the quarantine uh, takes place in, in the, the facility that they're assigned to. Thank you, John. Now to Emily Fannin from WKOW-TV in Madison. Emily? Hi, thanks for taking this call. Um, I want to talk about contact tracers. Um, I know the DHS secretary just said they're uh, sending out more uh, applications to get more. Uh, my question is, back in May, DHS reported that they received over 4,500 applications for contact tracers. Today, there's only about 1,200 across the state. So can you explain what's happened since then and what's the reason we're still not at that level? Is it that they were all unqualified? Is there not enough money to budget for them? Yeah, so Emily, we um, we have finally worked through um, <laughs> that whole, that initial tranche of applications um, and uh, have brought many of them on board. Um, some of them who, uh, who, who due to sort of the, um, you know, the difficulty of the work, uh, have taken themselves out of, um, out of the equation. Um, some who, who were not meeting expectations, certainly that happens. Um, people with the best of intentions to help their community and get involved uh, may, not, may not ultimately end up being the best fit for this. But we have 
as you as you suggest, brought a lot of folks on board, um, and we will we have reopened that posting. We want to make sure we have the most qualified candidates, uh, and so uh, are vetting them on the front end. Um, and obviously, the pool of folks we interview out of that um, that 4,500 that you mentioned. Uh, uh, was 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 a lot smaller than the total number of applications, um, uh, and so we will continue to move through that process. We we welcome those applications. We encourage them. We want to have a pool of, um, uh, of uh, that is robust, so that we can pick the the best and the most qualified folks uh, uh, to to be part of this team. Um, and we're anxious to start the interview process again and bring more folks on board. Thank you, Emily. Now to Sean Kirkby from Wisconsin Health News. Sean. Hi, um, thank you for holding this. Um, workforces at hospitals across the state are being strained due to community spread. What steps are you taking to ensure that the uh, surge facility is fully staffed? Are you issuing any new regulatory flexibilities or requesting any state or federal money to address workforce issues? Thank you. Yeah, Sean, we um, uh, we have at least one um, uh, staffing contract in place, and are and are working to uh, expand uh, those resources. Um, uh, Deb, I don't if you want to say more specifics about this. You're you're you're, um, you're closer to this. Um, we are, and, and Secretary Plum, it's exactly what you said. We have a variety of strategies, almost like the tentacles that feed into the the hub of a bicycle, the spokes into the hub a variety of um, staffing agencies looking across at various health systems in terms of outside of the state of Wisconsin that could possibly come in, just a variety of ways so that we get the very best staff to be able to provide um, relief to our current workforce. So a lot of different strategies. We're not relying on just one. Okay, thank you, Sean. Now to Adrian Mendez from TMJ4 in Milwaukee. Adrian. Adrian Mendez. And once Hi, more. can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you so much for taking my call, guys. Um, so obviously here outside of the State Fair Park, we are seeing the National Guard trucks, but Governor Tony Evers, uh, this question is for you. We have another uh, big story happening in the Milwaukee area today. What resources has your office deployed in response to requests from the Wauwatosa mayor and other city leaders for assistance following this afternoon's charging decision regarding Officer Joseph Mensa? Uh, as you say, the, the National Guard is, uh, is present in the Milwaukee area and we're working minute by minute and hour by hour over the last several uh, days and weeks, frankly, uh, with the local officials trying to meet their needs. Thank you, Adrian. Now to Ben Krumholtz from WLUK-TV in Green Bay. Ben? Hi, thank you uh, for the opportunity today. Is the long-term plan to keep bringing patients from the Fox Valley and Northeast regions down to the alternate care facility at State Fair Park, or are you exploring any alternate care facilities in these regions, and if so, where? Yeah, so when we were looking at sites in the spring, um, uh, a number of uh, sites were scouted by the Army Corps of Engineers, so uh, we, we do have... Um, uh, uh, some sites that have already been looked at. Again, though, I think it's important to understand that um, because of the investments we made in the spring, uh, uh, that is what has positioned us to be able to open this this uh, current facility uh, in a week. Um, should we need to execute on a, on additional facilities, it is a it is a longer term project. It is a, a sort of month to six week potentially project. And so um, we are we are looking at all our options. We are in, in very close communication with uh, hospitals across the state, uh, as well as looking at our data and, and, and where we think this is headed um, to make uh, good decisions moving forward. Um, but, but I just want to be clear, these aren't things that um, pop up over the weekend uh, ready to go uh, on Monday. Thank you, Ben. Now to Todd Richmond from the Associated Press. Todd?
Todd Richmond. Hi, can you hear me? Hi. Hi, hello. Hi, uh, thanks for doing another uh, uh, news here today. Uh, does the decision to activate the National Guard in Walla Tulsa signal that Officer Minza will not be charged? Have you heard what Chisholm's charging decision will be? Uh, I'm sorry to give you a, a short answer, but no, we have no idea what that decision will be. Thank you, Todd. Now to Nick Williams from Milwaukee Business Journal. Nick. You are unmuted. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, uh, this question is for Governor Evers. Um, in the city of Milwaukee, they've um, asked businesses to submit a COVID-19 safety plan. And if it is approved, they're allowed to operate at 100% capacity. And so far, over 300 small businesses have, have gotten their approval. Um, would you consider amending the indoor capacity ruling for municipalities that have this type of system in place? No, our, 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 uh, I don't know if I can do this without feedback. The, um, our, our order is what it is. It, it, it can be, if, uh, if a, uh, county or municipality, uh, health, health system has, uh, more stringent, uh, uh, expectations uh, that that uh, that takes precedence over ours, but that's the only circumstance by which uh, uh, our order can be um, uh, changed. Thank you, Nick. Now to Heather Poltrock from WSAW TV in Wausau. Heather, thank you for taking my call. Um, so, uh, with Wisconsin surging cases, like we've seen in other states, where New York and Arizona put a call to action for other healthcare workers from other states to assist, is that something that Wisconsin will do? Um, and if so, can you share how that staff would be distributed? Uh, so, one of the flexibilities we we um, uh, we put back in place last week was the ability for out of state. Uh, physicians to practice here in Wisconsin, and for starters, you know uh, some, a number of our hospital systems uh, have footprints in 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 a variety of states, uh, and they have already started working across their systems uh, uh, to be able to access physicians uh, from from outside of the state uh, uh, when they you know if if and when they need them. Um, I think we are absolutely currently exploring how we would tap into additional out-of-state resources should we need them, uh, some of which uh, uh, Deb talked a little bit about in terms of our staffing strategy, um, uh, but understanding that it may, it may not just be the alternate care facility who needs out-of-state assets, it, it uh, will also be our hospitals and so how we work together. So we're not competing for those same resources, but bringing to bear as many of them as are necessary uh, to meet need. I think it's also uh, important to note that um, uh, we are working closely with our colleagues in FEMA and HHS to tap into resources that they can bring to bear and understand lessons um, and work that they did in states um, like New York and Arizona, which you mentioned, and others, as they needed um, uh, assistance and capacity to really meet the needs uh, when they were seeing their hospitals uh, in, in similar uh, positions to where we are now. And so we are we will also take advantage of that um, and, and we'll... Um, uh, uh, use our federal partners uh, as well uh, where that is appropriate. Thank you, Heather. Now to Molly Beck from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Molly? Hi, thanks for having this call. Uh, could you talk about how the patients who will be coming to the field hospital, how they will be transported? Uh, Deb, can I kick that one to you? You absolutely can. Uh, how they will be transported is once the decision is made and the patient has been accepted by our chief medical officer or his designee for transfer, we have Flight for Life that is uh, a company within Children's Hospital and Freighter. They will go and uh, pick up the patient and transport them in one of their ground ambulances to the uh, facility, to the uh, alternate care facility. So it will be a hospital to the facility transfer. Thank you, Molly. Now to Jonathan Neiser from NBC 26 in Green Bay. Jonathan. 
Uh, yes. Uh, at one point, relatively recently, uh, it seemed like community spread was primarily being blamed on private gatherings. Uh, you know, people getting together in their garage to watch the Packer game or holding a, a birthday party or something like that. How will the uh, emergency order uh, have any effect if uh, those kinds of things are still possibly uh, unaffected by said order? Certainly the order does nothing to uh, require anything in a person's home. Uh, that's why uh, yesterday and today, and I think just about every day I've been sitting here in front of this camera, I've talked about the fact that we're urging, pleading, hoping that people will stay safer at home. Clearly, uh, community spread happens not just in retail outlets, uh, and and uh, lots of it happens in situations where people are inviting lots of people into their home, sometimes not knowing uh, the health status of those folks. So I, we continue to, it's, a, it, it's, it's, it's all, it, all of this is around individual responsibility, every single piece of it, whether it's related to our order or related to people's behavior uh, in their homes and any place in between. We have, a pan we have a pandemic that is out of control in the state of Wisconsin. We're doing our best to encourage people to stay at home, limit your interactions with others, and to, and to make sure that if you do go out, you're, you're wearing a mask. And, uh, uh, and, and when you're in retail outlets, um, it, it's uh, wear your mask. Try not to be in situations where you're with a bunch of people that you don't know their health status in a small space because they will, um, uh, there's a high, high probability of uh, uh, becoming uh, COVID, uh, COVID latest victim. It, it is around individual responsibility. I, there, no, one, no one can um, uh, convince me of anything else. And I went on a rant yesterday. I don't wanna go through it again today, but it's important. People's lives are at stake here. Uh, the ability for healthcare workers to do their work is at stake here. And if we just uh, blatantly ignore that issue, uh, we'll still be sitting here counting the numbers and uh, it'll get worse and worse. So we need people to respond in the best way possible, the best Wisconsin way possible. Thank you, Jonathan. Now to Stephanie Hoff from West Politics. Stephanie. Hello, and, and thanks for taking my call today. Who exactly requested that you open up that alternative care facility? So we've been in close contact with the hospitals in the um, Fox Valley region, uh, as we've discussed many times. Uh, and uh, collectively um, and in consultation with uh, leadership, um, you know, as part of our statewide response, we made that decision uh, together yesterday. Um, and, uh, you know, I, we're, we're all um, sad that this is where we've gotten to, but um, it was an important decision and, and we'll be ready to take patients uh, starting next Wednesday. Thank you, Stephanie. Now to Mason Dowling from WAOW-TV in Wausau. Mason. Hi, this is Natalie Sapilo from WAOW in for Mason. Um, I just had a really quick question. How many total patients will this alternate care facility be able to hold? Uh, so it's um, it, it's currently, um, and Curly envisions 530 um, uh, uh, bed spaces. Thank you. Now to Will Cushman from WIS Context. Will? Good afternoon. Um, so West Dallas is uh, a long distance from a lot of places in Wisconsin, as we know. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm curious about what contingencies there might be when and if a patient um, does not want to be transported to the alternate care facility if they're a candidate um, for being transported there, um, uh, what are what are options if a, if a patient um, doesn't agree to it? Thank you. I, I assume that if the patient is not uh, willing to be transported, it's not something that would come to 
Deb's attention or to the attention of uh, the CMO at the alternate care facility. Um, uh, but Deb, if you if you have more on protocols in that space, I, I'd welcome your comments. You are absolutely correct, uh, Secretary Palm. That would not be a decision or that we would participate in whatsoever. Uh, being a former hospital leader, I, I would say to the the answer to that question is that uh, the hospital staff will have to work with the family as well as the patient to make sure that continued care is provided to that patient should they not want to be transferred. They will have to find uh, other ways to care for the patient, keep the patient within the facility, et cetera. That will have to be a conversation that hospitals will have with the patient and their family. Thank you, Will. Now to Alex Jokic from KSTP TV in Minneapolis. Alex? Okay, we'll move on then to Evan Peterson from Fox 6 in Milwaukee. Evan? Hi there, my question is for oh. Governor Evers, and I believe this was already asked earlier, but I may have had a hard time hearing his response, so I'll, I'll ask it again anyway. Uh, Governor Evers, several communities are on alert this afternoon concerning a pending decision from the Milwaukee County District Attorney regarding a suspended TOSA police officer. The National Guard, as we've said, is at the State Fair Park. Are they on standby or on alert for any potential unrest that may come as a result of this? They're, they're working directly with the local officials uh, for any, uh, any, any, any possible option that you mentioned. Uh, they are there to assist the local, the local um, uh, municipal officials in this uh, arena, doing the same thing they have over the past several months in various other places across the state, and that is protecting infrastructure and making sure that uh, peaceful protest is allowed to happen. Thank you, Evan. Now to Terry Sater from WISN TV in Milwaukee. Terry. Yep. Good afternoon. How will the State Fair Park facility, it's been more than five months since it was set up. What is being done to clean that facility and have any changes been made into the ventilation system to assure that patients will have a safe place to be treated. Yeah, I'll ask I'll ask Deb to comment on this, but right that is that, that is essentially why it will be uh it will take a week for us to be able to take our first patient because we did um I, I guess you could say mothball the facility um uh, once it was stood up um to keep it in reserve for a time when we might need it and so um all of those things are happening over the next week uh to to get it ready to receive Patients, but Deb can speak more to the specifics of um, all of the pieces that are coming into place. And it's exactly why we need um, several days to ramp up, to bring our food service back, our linen service back. Um, we are in the process of deep cleaning the facility um, to ensure a sanitized uh, environment. Um, the HVAC system, we have an incredible HVAC system that was put in place when the facility was constructed according to standards uh, to treat the COVID, po uh, COVID population. So all of those remain in place. During the time that we have been mothballed, the facility has been kept up to date. We have regular checks on the physical plant. The facility is regularly cleaned. We now have to bring in those essential patient services like food, the um, electronic medical record, et cetera, to, to um, bring back the patient's uh, health care system in place, to put it back in place. Thank you, Terry. And finally, we'll go to News 3 Now in Madison. WISC-TV. Okay, then that concludes today's briefing. Please continue to monitor the DHS COVID-19 web pages for data and guidance. Additional information can be found on the websites of the Governor, the Department of Workforce Development, the Department of Public Instruction, the Department of Children and Families, and Wisconsin Emergency Management. Be safe and have a good afternoon. This program is a production of Wisconsin Eye, an independent, nonpartisan, nonprofit media network with a mission to inform, educate, and engage the citizens of Wisconsin.
Wisconsin Eye is the nation's first and only independently funded state civic broadcast network, providing gavel-to-gavel access to government proceedings and events at the state capitol.